And I'm going to talk to you today how I think a little bit of how neurosurgery is changing, because as we said, we're now in the molecular era. We're not in an era anymore where we're just using 100-year-old tools like a light microscope. So as a neurosurgeon, when I decide to operate on somebody, it's usually for one of a, a limited number of reasons. The first one is diagnostic. So to take a piece of that tumor out, so that we're using either by looking under the microscope or by using molecular tests so we can figure out what it is. We also want to be prognostic. So as parents, you want to know how likely is my child to survive, or if my child's not going to survive, how long are they likely to live? And a lot of time we do that by figuring out what kind of tumor it is. We also want to be therapeutic. So in some cases, when, as the neurosurgeon, when I take that lump out, it actually increases the chance of survival. And in fact, for some kinds of brain tumors, when I take that lump out and throw it in the garbage can, it's gone for good, and that's all we need to do, and everybody's happy. And that's what we kind of want to change everything to. The other thing that I can do as a neurosurgeon when I take that lump out is I can unclog the spinal fluid, the CSF sometimes, and avoid the need for that kid to have a long-term shunt. So the third most common kind of, of childhood brain tumor is something called ependymoma. And when I was in the laboratory back in 2005, we knew that this disease called ependymoma could occur in all different parts of the brain. The top part of the brain, the back part of the brain, and in the spinal cord, because the spinal cord is really sort of like an outgrowth of your brain. And if we took those out and we gave them to the pathologist to look at under the light microscope using 100, 200 year old technologies, they couldn't tell them apart, right? But when we took them into the lab, we were able to see that ependymomas from different parts of the brain and spinal cord were different at a molecular level and actually show that they were different diseases. And when we went on, not only did we find that ependymomas from the top, back, and spinal cord parts of the brain were different, but there were subgroups within the subgroups. So when, when push came to shove, and we've done all the molecular biology now, we know that there are nine kinds of ependymoma. So it's like we know every kind of Toyota now. We know the Camry, we know the Corolla, we know the minivan, we know the sporty car. We've broken this down into all of its different kinds of ependymoma. And we know that their biology is different, and we know that we're going to have to be treated different. We need to use molecular biology to figure this out. And there's a huge difference, as I'll show you in a second, in the prognosis between these different kinds of tumors. And in the future, when we start getting drugs that actually work, there'll probably be a very big difference in the way we treat them. So in the back part of the head, in children, that makes up more than 50% of ependymomas. There's two kinds. And they have boring names because the reviewers at the journal, when we first submitted this, had no imagination, so we call them A and B. I have not so nice boring names to the reviewers. Oh. What you can see is that the A's in red there are younger than the B's. And that's the same no matter where we look in the world. If we get samples from any part of the world and we look, it's, this, it's, you know, it's, it's not like the British kids are different from the Chinese kids who are different from the South African kids who are different from the Toronto kids. No matter where we look in the world, we're humans and these things are, are constant. And not only that, so I don't know how many of you, I wish there was a laser on here. I don't know how many of you have seen survival curves before. I know people have been flashing them up, but you see that curve Way on the other side there, there's a blue line and a red line. Oh, there is. Ah, there we go. So you see there's a blue line here and a red line. A blue line and a red line. So for those of you who don't read this kind of data all the time, as you, as you go across the page, it means going forward in time, and each of those lines is a group. And every time the line dips, it means somebody died, which is kind of depressing. But if you look at the blue line there, you can see those kids do really, really well, whereas the A group, they actually do really quite poorly. These look exactly the same under the microscope, though. The pathologists using their 100-year-old technologies can't tell us about it. But once we bring molecular biology into the, into the mix, we can tell you if you are an A or if you are a B quite easily. There's also different kinds of, of ependymomas within the top part of the brain. It's what we call a supratentorial ependymoma. The most common one being one that has a fusion between two genes. So you take two genes and you snap them in half and you stick them together, kind of like peanut butter and chocolate. And when, with these, those two genes that work normally in health, they're doing good things, but once you snap them apart and stick them together, they make the part of your brain grow in the wrong way and you get an ependymoma. And now we can do this with a fairly easy test and de determine whether or not this, like this fish test here or this staining test here, determine if someone has one of these supertentorial so-called relay fused ependymomas. And so why is that important? It's important because in the past, and probably even currently, a lot of diagnoses of supertentorial ependymoma are screwed up by the pathologists. It's difficult. So something gets called an ependymoma that's not, right? Or something gets 
uh, not called an ependymoma when it really is because pathology using the light microscope is, is difficult. But when you have very objective tests like this, suddenly it's not so hard anymore. So when we looked at all the different risk factors to determine whether your child is likely to survive or not, the most important thing is not the way it looks under the microscope, it's the molecular variant of the disease you have. So which of those nine types of ependymomas you have is the most important thing. So mother nature is really running the show and she's, she's made her decisions most of the time before the, that poor kid walks in the door. So this is just showing the difference again now between the A's and the B's and showing that the, there's a difference in their outcome no matter where you are in the world. And what I want you to notice is no, no matter where you are in the world, if you've got one of those blue tumors, you're almost certainly going to survive. Okay? We used to say that the most important thing in the treatment of a child with a pneumonia was how much of the surgeon of how much of the tumor the surgeon took out. We have to take it all out. So neurosurgeons, pediatric neurosurgeons will go to their meetings and beat on their chests like silverback gorillas and brag about these great big ependymomas they took out. And they'd be willing to cause quite severe complications. I thought that that was actually all a load of bollocks. Am I allowed to say that? I learned that in London last week. And I thought it was, I thought it was because the A tumors are hard to take out and the B tumors are easy to take out. So I gathered up tumors from all over the world, and we, we collaborated with people from all over the world, and when we did that, what we saw was, in fact, that's not true. You really still do need to take all of a PFA ependymoma out. You really do. So as a surgeon, even if we're gonna do some damage to your child, and maybe your child will be weak after, afterwards, or maybe they need a feeding tube for a little while, but their best chance of survival is for the neurosurgeon to take it all out, even after we account for all this fancy molecular stuff. Also, we still need to do radiation. So in a pendomoma, for most kids when we radiate them for brain tumors, we won't radiate them under the age of three. But for a pendomoma, we'll go all the way down to 12 months now in North America. Because we're only providing it to a localized area at the back of the head. And the, that's not the part of your, your head where you're doing your creative writing or your calculus, right? It's more just balance and control and stuff. So it's not gonna have as big an effect on the child's IQ. And if you don't radiate, as shown in the lower line here, you can see that the survival is pretty, pretty rotten. If you have, so I, I was definitely sure that taking out all the blue tumors didn't matter, right? Because they do so well, and turns out I was wrong on that as well. Turns out you have a better chance of survival if we take out all of the blue tumor as well. So basically, we were, we, they were right all along. But this is the slide that I really like. Right now, in North America, any kid who has a posterior fossa pneumonia gets radiated. There are some places in Europe, particularly in France, where after the surgeon gets a gross total resection, they don't irradiate, they just watch and wait and see if it comes back. My boss came into my office a couple of years ago and he said he'd operated on a teenager and he'd taken the entire posterior fossa pendomoma out and the parents did not want to radiate the, the child and what did I think of that? And I said, those parents are neglectful, let's get a judge, we're gonna take custody away, we're gonna force them to treat that kid properly. And he said, well, how do you really know that? Show me the data and then I realized it didn't have the data. Um, but when I went out and got the data, it turns out I was wrong again because about half of the kids with PFB ependymomas, if you don't irradiate them after you take it out, it never comes back. And if it does come back, you can take it out again and give the radiation in a delayed fashion. So that means that maybe some of these kids who are getting radiation, we don't need to do that. And if we can cure some of the kids and give them less therapy and not irradiate them and not have their IQ go down, have the, all those other problems that Roger was talking about, then we've done a really good thing. So now I'm going to talk about medulloblastoma, which is my main research in interest. So medulloblastoma, most of you probably already know this, is in the back of your head. So you put your hand in the back of your head, where your, underneath your hand is where medulloblastoma occurs in the cerebellum. And it was discovered and described in around 1920 by a guy named Harvey Cushing, who's a neurosurgeon in Boston. And the way that Harvey Cushing would diagnose a medulloblastoma back in 1920 is he would cut a piece of it out, then he would walk it down the hallway to his pathologist, Louise Eisenhart. She would stain it with this purple stain and look at it under the microscope and say, Harvey, that's a medulloblastoma. The way they diagnose a medulloblastoma in Liverpool in 2016 is Connor Malucci cuts a piece of the tumor out and he walks it down the hallway and they stain it with this purple dye and the pathologist tells him it's, it's a medulloblastoma. How depressing is that? That's a hundred years ago. Would anybody here want to ride in a hundred-year-old plane? 
or talk on a 100-year-old telephone. So if we can do all these things in aviation, in the automotive industry, in the telecommunications industry, if we can send people to the moon, why are we still using 100-year-old technology to diagnose medulloblastoma? So starting about five to 10 years ago, a number of us around the world started looking at the molecular biology of medulloblastoma and trying to see if we could tell them apart, as Roger said. And indeed, when we, when we look at them at a molecular level, we can. And I'm not gonna, I know most of you aren't molecular biologists, but I would make this akin to, we're listening to what the tumors are saying, because we're looking at seeing which genes are turned on and turned off, and we determine which genes or have, which tumors are having similar conversations. And when we do that, we can split them into four groups. Again, the, the colors overlap here with some of the colors in the epitomoma slides, but that's just because there's only so many colors. And what you can see is if you have one of these blue wint tumors, you're almost certainly gonna live. See that line's flat? But if you have one of these yellow group three tumors, you're gonna do really poorly. And again, this is not a Toronto thing. This is not a UK thing. It, no matter where people are in the world, and no matter what technique they use to determine the molecular subgroup for the tumors, we see the same thing. Humans are humans around the world. Right? So there is no such thing as medulloblastoma. I like to say, what do Bigfoot, the Loch Ness Monster, the Yeti, and medulloblastoma have in common? None of them exist. They're all made up by humans. They're all fictitious entities. Because th those four types of medulloblastoma are so different from each other, we really shouldn't be regarding them as one disease anymore. Um, Targeted therapies in the future are probably going to have to be subgroup specific because the targets are not the same between the different subgroups of medulloblastoma. And we'll come back to that in a second. Um, and I, I don't know if I'm going to show this slides today, but we've published a paper recently showing we probably don't have to be quite as aggressive in the operating room as neurosurgeons with medulloblastomas as we have been in the past because it's probably okay to leave a little bit behind when we're going to radiate because the radiation will mop it up. Roger already showed this. This is one of the, the first agreements uh, in the pediatric brain tumor community where we all came together and we fought and we argued over a period of a couple days in Boston. And then we came to a consensus statement, a consensus being defined as something that everyone could live with but nobody liked. And we agreed that there were these four different diseases. So why does subgroup matter? So one of those subgroups, the red group, is called the Sonic Hedgehog group. And yes, that is named after the video game for any of you Nintendo fans in the crowd. Um, so the sonic hedgehog group of medulloblastoma has overactivity of the sonic hedgehog pathway. And if you give a patient with a sonic hedgehog tumor a drug that blocks the sonic hedgehog pathway, sometimes it'll go away. Now, it's just, we're just using a single agent, so it does come back. But the drugs actually work when you use them in the right patients. But the sonic hedgehog drugs are not going to work on the blue wind tumors. They're not going to work on the yellow group three tumors because those tumors don't have overactivity of the pathway. Right? When we're talking about targeted therapy, the whole idea is to find something that's different between the kid's normal cells and the cancer cell. Because you want to give a drug that kills the cancer cell but doesn't bother the normal cells. Right? And the sonic hedgehog abnormality is only in the sonic hedgehog tumors. We used to think, too, that medulloblastomas all arose from the cerebellum, which is the balanced part at the back of the brain, not the brain stem, which is something about the size of your thumb, which sits right in front of the cerebellum. Your, your brain stem is the size of your thumb. That's what lets you move your arms, lets you move your legs. It's what keeps you breathing, and it lets all the sensations go into your head. That's a very expensive piece of real estate, right? It's the, uh, the London of the brain sort of thing. When we're doing surgery, we don't want to go straying into the London of the brain because we don't want to cause any damage. And we used to think that tumors invaded the brainstem sometimes, but it turns out now for the, wind, the blue wind tumors, they actually start in the brainstem and grow out. We figured that out now by work done by Richard Gilbertson. And because we know those, those blue wind tumor patients do so well now, I don't try to get every last little bit in the operating room anymore. I, I leave a little bit larger chunk and I have the kid walk in and walk out as opposed to walk in and wheel out. Lots of cancers spread, right? Many of you probably know people who've had breast cancer that's spread to their lungs or their bones or, or colon cancer that's gone to the liver or the lymph nodes and stuff like that. Medulloblastoma also spreads, but it doesn't go to the lymph nodes because there is no lymph nodes in your brain. And it doesn't tend to go to faraway places like the lung and the liver and the bones. What it tends to do is it tends to cover the surface of the brain and spinal cord. 
German pathologists many years ago used to call the, the way the kids' brains looked at the time of autopsy Schukergaus, which means icing sugar, because when they, they autopsied these poor kids and they took their brains out, it looked like their brains had been dunked in icing sugar and the icing sugar had been allowed to dry. So as a surgeon, I cannot take out all this icing sugar coating on the surface of a brain. Nobody can. It's like butter on hot toast. It's done. Right? So it's going to have to, it's going to need a medical or a molecular therapy. There's a problem here though. 99% of the research that's done on medulloblastoma is done on samples from the primary tumor from the operating room. Not on the, med not on the metastasis. Right? But as I'll show you in a second, all the kids that are dying are dying of the metastasis. And in fact, the, the therapies that we do that cause all the problems, like all that radiation, are done to treat the metastasis. So all of this, all these tens of millions of dollars that are being spent by people like me and others, is all predicated on the assumption that the Mets are the same as the primary tumor. And it turns out they're not. Even if you just give sort of standard therapy, you can see differences in behavior between the primary tumor and the Mets. And then when we, when we do molecular biology, we see the Mets are completely different from the primary tumor. So a lot of that research, if our goal is to increase the cure rate, has been a waste. And as a community, that those of us in pediatric neuro-oncology, we need to refocus our efforts on looking at the metastasis because that's what's actually killing kids. I need to spend less time on the primary tumor because that's not actually killing very many kids at all. I'm gonna skip this just in the interest of time because I know I'm going too slow. We make another assumption though too. So I said to you that all of the research that's done is done on mostly tumors that are taken out fresh before all the radiation and chemotherapy is given. We take them to, the, to our labs and we sequence them and we give them drugs and we grow them in mice and we spend hours and years and millions of dollars to try and find better treatments. But then when we find a treatment that we think is a, is a possible new treatment, do we test it on kids who, who just come in the door who have an untreated tumor? No, we don't. We test it on kids who've had radiation and chemotherapy. And radiation and chemotherapy cause changes in the tumor. So it's another one of these assumptions that we've made where we do, we've always done all of our discovery up front and we always take our new drugs and use them at recurrence. And this also now is based on an assumption that the biology is the same, but it's just not. And in fact, most of the time when we're doing, talking about targeted therapy, we're talking about targeting a mutation. And if we do sequencing of the genome of a child's tumor at diagnosis and then their tumor at recurrence, the chance of a target that you, was there at diagnosis still being there at recurrence is about one in 20. What a waste of time. None of those clinical trials of targeted agents we were doing were ever gonna work, right? We were shooting 10 minutes after the ducks left. So what's gonna come of this? Well, in the future, any targeted trials of therapy for medulloblastoma, we're gonna need to rebiopsy because we need to make sure that the target is still there. Right? And we're, not only are, are the problems we're missing at the, 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 the ducks have long gone when we're shooting, but we're also missing the new mutations, the new flock of ducks that's coming at the time of recurrence. So we're shooting at targets that are gone and ignoring the new targets. So this is a fixable thing, but it's going to mean that kids are going to have to have a little bit more surgery. So this is just an example, a very blatant example of where there's an amplification in this gene here. It's a very well-known gene called NMYC. And you can see here in the same patient's recurrence, it's gone. It's just gone. So we have to stop making that assumption. We have a saying, and we probably got it from you over in here in England, if you take a million monkeys and you let them type for a million years, eventually they'll retype all the works of William Shakespeare. I don't want to be one of those monkeys anymore. I don't want to be doing things randomly anymore. I want to be doing things intelligently like a human. So we need to change the way that we do clinical trials for kids with brain tumors. I'm going to skip that. Roger covered a lot of this already, just from a neurosurgeon's perspective. The question always comes up for a DIPG, should we biopsy it or not? In my personal opinion, if a, if a DIPG is atypical, so the MRI doesn't look quite like DIPG, or the patient's presentation is not typical, then I think it's fine to biopsy the DIPG. If that patient is going to go on a clinical trial, particularly a clinical trial of a targeted therapy, I think it's a good idea to biopsy the DIPG. I do not, however, think that it's a good idea to do a routine biopsy of ch for children with DIPG when the clinical presentation is typical, 
when the MRI is typical, and when the child's just gonna get standard therapy. Because we do see some complications when we stick a needle in the middle of somebody's brainstem. Skip that. So I wanna end on a high note. I've been saying all these gloom and doom stuff, but I wanna show you when where we win, where, where we win. like we win big time. Um, there's a, a disease called tuberous sclerosis, some of you may have heard of. Um, it, it, the kids usually have a number of manifestations of it. They're often a little bit developmentally delayed, they often have seizures, and they can develop brain tumors. And they really develop this one kind of brain tumor called a, a SEGA, subependable giant cell astrocytoma. And in the past, you know, five, ten years ago, when these kids would come in with these, this, this big white tumor right here, I would operate on them. And it's a great operation. I love doing it because we could slip down between the two halves of the brain like a thief in the night and take the tumor out and the kids did really well, right? And we felt like heroes. I'm almost done. Unfortunately, I'm not, it's not really unfortunate, right? I, I, I'm a big fan of this. Um, we now know what causes that disease, tuberous sclerosis. We know what the gene is, right? And we have a drug against the gene and we're able to give that therapy before radiation and chemo because we don't usually have to provide radiation and chemo to these, these kids. And when you give this drug called rapamycin, the tumors get smaller, and in fact, in some cases, they completely disappear. And sometimes after you stop the drug, they never come back. Some kids, they do come back. Sometimes you have to restart the drug. I haven't done this operation in somewhere between five to 10 years now. I'm perfectly happy to go out of business. Right? So this is a situation where we understood the disease, we have a drug against the target, and the drug was provided at the right time before any of those other genotoxic therapies so that the tumor didn't get, it didn't get changed. And when we do this, we win. Right? We don't have to worry, you guys don't have to worry about all this, but because somebody's figured all this out now, we win. That's, that, that disease is something headed for the dustbin of history. So in conclusion, the molecular era has arrived. We should no longer be solely using this 100-year-old technology of the light microscope, right? Parents like you are often the ones demanding and wanting these molecular diagnoses, even when the clinicians don't know enough about them or are reluctant to use them. And I get requests all the time from all over the world from parents asking their tumors to be, for their tumors to be genotyped. Um, there are new things on the horizon. And when I say prolactinomization, there's going to be more diseases that are going to fade away that I'm not going to be able to operate on anymore. Right? Because once we have good medical therapies, you're just not going to need me anymore. That's fine. Um, what we really need to realize, though, is cancer is not a portrait. It's not that picture of your grandfather sitting over the fireplace that stays exactly the same over time. Cancer is a TV show, and it continues to evolve and change over time, and the characters, just like on Game of Thrones, that are there at season 10 are not necessarily the same characters that were there in season one, okay? And if we're gonna treat, if we're gonna treat in episode 10, then we need to know what's going on in episode 10, and if we're not gonna do that, then we need to treat up, up front during episode one. Um, what's my last thing here? Oh yeah. A lot of what we think we know about the neurosurgery of, of pediatric brain tumors is based on what we knew in the, the pre-molecular era. And a lot of that is changing. And a lot of the old neurosurgical literature is now irrelevant and out of date and needs to be redone. And with that, I'm done. Uh, oh, this is my magic consortium. It's actually out of date. There's a lot more people now. We're, up, we're probably up close to 100 centers. And we've collected like 1,500 to 2,000 medulloblastomas by cooperating with people all around the world. And there's a picture of my lab. Thanks.